The steel plate is, I mean, all the way up to dark side of the moon, that's what people were using. So all these classic recordings from the, all this through the 60s, through the sort of almost the mid 70s, where it's all the steel plate. Well, man, this is great to sit and talk to you and get some uh, specifics <laughs> about the uh, about the SP140. So, Ernest, you're a, we're we've been working on stuff for a long time, back and forth, sharing ideas, and uh, this is well the second time we've worked on something together. The Iconic Five, you know, the impulses, the custom impulses you made for the Iconic Five was uh, the first release that you know contained your work in it, uh, which was yes. spectacular, and now. So we've done this plate reverb, the SP140, short for steel plate uh, 140. So I guess that first of all, maybe we just get some things from you about um, the impulses themselves. I've been developing reverb impulses uh, since, since early 2000. I've released several commercial products and, uh, but I actually started working with Convolution back in the, in the mid nineties, uh, when it was not real time. And I used, uh, uh, I used various recordings when I traveled to various spaces to, uh, especially balloon pops and hand claps. And I developed an, uh, an analysis system that, that eliminates the, the imperfections of the microphone and the whole impulse. Uh, I'm not a fan of the sweet tone. I don't, I think it, it actually misses something. And, uh, so I've developed this proprietary over the years. I've developed this proprietary system that's really optimized for audio and it gives you, uh, a f really full sound. It, uh, it, it's totally omnidirectional. So you don't get a sense of where the sound's coming from, which, which is what a, a real reverb primary characteristic is. And um, so I applied this same similar kind of principle to the SP140. We had some uh, e examples of the SP140 that we analyzed, and then I, in effect, resynthesized it, eliminating all the potential uh, imp imperfections that happened. And so that you've actually got impulses that are go all the way out to uh, to 48k um, uh, and it has uh they're they're basically flat and they're totally omnidirectional and it's something that unfortunately sweep tones uh really don't have that ability to do uh you can hear that when you analyze um, uh sweep tone recordings oftentimes they have a very strong center uh image and with these you don't they're really when you listen to them completely wet they're totally omnidirectional in the sense that you can hear the signal go from the extreme far left to the far right of the speaker. Now, with the features that uh, Michael put in the SP140, the uh, you can adjust this uh, from mono or you can collapse the stereo field, but it's already there and you can adjust it, you know, for depending on the application that you want. The flatness, I think, is really important because it's it gives you a very neutral starting point. So the user can like impart any kind of coloration they want. Right. Um, and often, like we were just talking earlier um, about this idea that reverb should, you know, with a, within a mix, especially like a pop mix, it tends to be pretty full on. You know, it occupies a lot of space. So reverb uh, that has sort of standout um, bumps or kind of any kind of uh, overlapping frequencies between within the stereo field kind of gets this thickness that you often have to try and get out of the way. But what's beautiful about these is that they sort of sit underneath the music in a way that a reverb should. Like it's not obtrusive. Right. You don't have to work too hard to get them to sit in nicely with your mix. Uh, well, this is the, the the practical problem that you encounter. What which I find with uh, with sweet tones is that your speakers are not perfect. There's no such thing as a flat speaker, so you can have resonances in that speaker, uh, and you've got microphones that are also not flat. So you've got these two layers that, when you record a sweet tone, you've got this this information that's being colored, and this is. Uh, 
you know, when I started using basically various sorts of sonic impulses, uh, I was able to, you know, to, uh, to analyze the characteristic of the room and then resynthesize it uh, properly with a signal that's in effect flat and neutral that includes all the frequencies. So there's no coloration. And then this one of the characteristics that people have commented on my reverbs is that you, it's like a it's like a veil has been removed. There's a lot of clarity in the signal because you're in effect hearing the reverb of all frequencies. And obviously for users in commercial productions or you know any kind of production you're gonna you can shape it uh after the fact with a high pass low pass filter or add some kind of coloration in the middle uh to sculpt the sound you know depending on your mix so now you synthesize these right like these are not so like you said you're not using sweeps uh you have your own sort of right. way of, multiple ways of doing this but this is a sort of um it's essentially a synthesized thing. And does that cross over with some of your work that you've done with drones too, in terms of like the texture yes. of, of noise? Yeah. Uh, yes, it has. Uh, I Actually, I think I released the first sampling CD that used Convolution. It was back in 1998. I made a CD called uh, Drone Archaeology that was used a lot. It was um, distributed by Sound Ideas and used a lot in, in, in the film community, film and television community. And these are drones that actually, instead of using convolution for filtering or reverbs, I actually use convolution to build tones and uh, very rich evolving tones. Uh, that was, you know, that's what I first started experimenting with it uh, in a creative sense. And then it was only later after 2000 when they started, computers started getting fast enough to do real time that I started looking into the problem of creating reverbs that are open and transparent and i guess it's i sort of have the engineering aesthetic of keeping it flat and including all frequencies so this way the user has access to all of it uh, all the whole entire spec reverb spectrum and then they can sculpt it depending on the musical application so i had to end up building proprietary signals that had these properties and uh, the the technique has evolved over the last uh, 20 plus years to uh, I've kept refining it. And uh, SP140 is my last uh, refinement iteration. <laughs> so right with it. the with the density feature, right? That's the that's one of the things. That right. That's a new feature that I added yeah. is this uh, one of the in our discussions with this product, uh, I was talking to Michael about the potential of adjusting the density. One of the things about a rich reverb is when it has a super rich tail, uh, it, it in effect, it has a reverb that has all the frequencies from 20 to 20 kilohertz. And one of the things that that percussion music or music with fast transients, that they in effect get somewhat smeared by the uh, the, the real density of a full reverb. And so this is where I developed these, in effect, less dense reverbs that have the same properties. They sonically sound the same as the full dense reverb. As you move the element uh, to the left, it'll get less and less dense. And the least dense one is at the first setting. And the advantage is that you can play really percussive, very dense mixes, and the reverb will complement it and it won't, it'll be sort of less intrusive. The most dense, clearly you would use it in applications like ballads or when there's more space between the events, you know, musical events, so that, you know, there's air, there's time for the reverb, the richness of the reverb to come in. So you've got this option where, depending on the musical application, you'd use the most dense for like a, a ballad or something where there's a lot of space in the music or it's majestic or there's you know room between the events so you can hear this real richness but when you get applications where there's uh, or i'm sorry arrangements where there's a, a, a lot going on in the music you don't want the smearing of the transients you want this definition in the, especially in the top end and this is what these lighter dense reverbs impart to the sound thinking of um, historic examples. Um, there are all these different ways that in a classic setting that people were trying to create 
sort of clarity from the instruments themselves and then also have the reverb kind of sit underneath but still be wet and present and have that balance. So one of the ways that uh, people would do that was is with the pre-delays, which we have built in, of course, because it's just a standard classic feature. But then another thing, as you're saying, like with a, a more dense mix, you know, people typically would roll roll up the low end to maybe between three and six hundred hertz uh, to get out the low mids out of the way from the reverb itself. Um, and then they kind of take off the top end sometimes. Uh, another thing that I found myself doing was finding, like for the guitar example, realizing that the guitar itself occupies this kind of like high mids area, and then using the node in the filters to try and take out that. So that, in other words, the guitar sits here, but the reverb sort of sits in the negative space around it in a way. You know, so like we're, you're always trying to find a way to separate the reverb from the the instrument right. or the instruments themselves. Um, and I, I realized it too, like in talking about the Eddie Van Halen example, like the early Eddie Van Halen sound is to take the dry guitar, put it off to one side using the stereo right. image, put the plate reverb of the guitar off to the, off to the right. And that was consistent for the first, you know, up until the 1984 album, he was keeping dry guitar on one side uh, on the left specifically, and then the reverb off to the right. So in a way it's like all of those features are there for you to use those kind of classic tricks. But then this density feature is is something new that I think is really exciting. You know, the, the ability to try and um, have it sit there in a different way. And as you said, like with more spacious or, you know, where there's a slower song about it or something. One of the example, one of the examples we were talking about was uh, Enya, you know, so Enya has like these there's sort of right. space in between uh musical elements it's kind of wide open it's not this it's not all going at the same time but in those songs you can hear that they have a very full spectrum at least on the instruments themselves a right. very full spectrum reverb that's that's present uh very present it's very much a part of it so um well but, it's also i would consider also uh i wouldn't ignore orchestral music or film music where uh Oftentimes the, the percussion has, you know, you want the clarity in the percussion, but then when you have slower moving other elements in your in your arrangement or in the score, the you can use the denser reverb. Uh, so you can mix and match to optimize for each instrument group in the orchestra, you know, in your in your film production. Well, you, and you did mention that too, that something about the transient. So what is it about transients too that like, uh, cause you to need uh, more space in the reverb? It's the transients from percussion are actually most acoustic instruments are very wide band and they include almost all harmonics. Percussion will include the full entire range. Uh, orchestral instruments often will have the transients up to the, to probably to their, it's a broad band from their lowest note up typically. Uh, unless they have a percussion component in it, like a piano, actually, or uh, or uh, harp, or uh, even guitar, there's a there's a transient percussive element that's pretty broad band. And uh, the pr the problem is when you have infinite number of harmonics, it's um, you know the analogy I'd use is uh, think of uh, of symbols. Uh, they 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 don't they're not all the harmonics and yet they sing they have this presence where when you think of white noise you can have white noise mimicking a symbol but it has everything and it's it, it in effect it's so dense it doesn't cut through as much ironically as a symbol so a symbol has in effect less uh harmonic components or i should say partials and yet it it cuts through more than uh when something has infinite number of harmonics or near infinite harmonics like white noise. So it's it's sort of this a little bit the same analogy with uh, the density factor uh, with the reverb. Uh, it's it sort of it it leaves a bit of room for the sound to breathe and, uh, and for the transients to breathe. It doesn't kind of compete because you don't want to excite an infinite number of uh, sort of partials or harmonics uh, 
for every single note or attack that you do, you you want it somewhat selective, and it's sort of like the symbol thing. It'll it'll it, it less is more in a certain way, and it it allows the instrument to to sing a little bit better. You're gonna remember now the even though there's these five levels, they when you listen to them carefully, you'll notice that they all have the same characteristic, and they do. They're they're they sound like the SB140. It's just that uh, these other less dense versions are in effect lighter versions. And to the best of my knowledge, I think this is the only uh, reverb instrument out there uh, with this feature. It certainly is. I think it's super cool. It's really wild because, you know, I kind of le I lean towards like very classic things. But I think that's where you and I come from different places, but we sort of complement each other on, right. on these collaborations because like, <laughs> I, love, I love looking at a piece of software and feeling like it's, like it's actually a piece of gear in front of me. And you're very much more like in the sort of uh, modern cutting edge. Uh, you like the modern cutting edge aesthetics and the kind of uh, the tools. But this, it's true. It really does. It's pretty astounding because you can do everything with it. You can, you can do the classic thing but it has this kind of new wild features. It's pretty exciting. Plate number two for in particular has this kind of like a uh, very spring, like shuddery kind of quality to it. And it made me think of like your work with drones. So as I understand it, uh, within a plate or, or a physical space, there are certain resonant frequencies or kind of like, and I've noticed this with some of the acoustic space stuff that you've done too, is that there can be, uh, there's one in particular I'm thinking of, a, a famous space that we uh, are are going to put in some an instrument later that has this kind of low end that kind of undulates in this way. Uh, whereas like the mid-range is kind of smoother and, you know, like there's different things that are happening at different frequencies. And I, I always, I think, and I'm not sure, I guess I wanted to ask you about that, is, is that part of the kind of... Uh, drone work that you've done too that it has like it's not just it's not just a noise file that's panned left and right or something like that like there's more going on than that the thing is the the uh the plates are they're electroacoustic so they have each metal surface i mean no two no two metal surface are are identical it's sort of like symbols they all have slightly different characteristics and Oftentimes what they do is the way they decay, uh, whether it's in the low range, the mid range, or in the treble, they all have um, differences. And uh, th there's no two identical sounding plates. In this uh, product, in the SB140, we have, there's five different plates and they all have s slightly different characteristics. And in fact, the way the sound decays is slightly different in all of them and depending on the on the material that you're that you're using it's going to make the reverb sound different so if it, if it, so depending on the instrument it's going to bring out a certain character if you select a different reverb you know one of these five reverbs with a mono plate you have a single driver and a single pickup with a stereo plate you have a mono driver and then two pickups from t sampling sort of what's happening at two different points. Oh, well, yeah. You, you, well, you know, that's the, it's an interesting point you brought up. Um, because of the way it's built, it's basically one sheet of metal that's vibrating. And it's and there is going to be some kind of correlation between the left and right channels because it's the same sheet that's vibrating. This is one of the advantages when you resynthesize something is that you can have it where there's absolutely no correlation, which is ideal in terms of the maximum sort of sense of omnidirectional uh, uh, feeling that you get when you listen to a reverb is that the, there's no correlation between the left and the right channel. It's just very open and it's almost it's almost like random. And it's sort of that gives you that character of the sound when you're in a large space, it kind of envelops you. And uh, this, what we did when we, we modeled it is we made the both channels totally independent and i give, i think it gives you a, a wider uh stereo feel and then whereas when, it, when you have two pickups uh, you know even if they're on different points of the metal plate 
there is going to be a bit of correlation. It's still, you know, it sounds pretty, it sounds pretty separated. I mean, the stereo does sound like stereo, obviously, but this is going to max it out to the most when you do, when you do it, this, the approach that uh, we did. And then when you collapse that down to mono, I think that's, so that's one of the things I was mentioning in the tutorial video. I, I kind of had to think through yes. like what, you know, when you have a stereo plate, you have, like you said, you're sampling the same plate in two different places. So there's, there's crossover, there's um, coincident frequencies. So if, like a lot of times, you know, when I was working at the studio, they had, we had plates and we had our far two right channels were our, our plates. And anytime somebody would want to bring it to the middle, just, I don't know, nobody thought too much about it, but if you want to do a true mono plate, you would just mute one channel and pan the one channel to the middle. But instead, most people would just pan both channels toward the middle. And the closer you get, there's this kind of kind of thickening that happens from all these coincident frequencies right. kind of playing well, at the same I, time. Well, I think as soon as you get into the lower frequencies, it's more the, the plate uh, vibrates more consistently more consistently so uh the the left and right channels in the lower frequencies are going to be closer in phase and when they sum up you're going to that's is where you're getting that thickening in the low end in you know once you get above the i guess the base and or the low mid-range the there's more red in this between the left and the right channels and so when you sum it it it'll, it it won't it won't add this coloration that you'll get in the bass where the harmonics are probably not as random. Whereas when we did ours, we, we truly made it random to the left and right so that when it sums to mono, you don't get this thickening. Between us, you know, between our ideas, passing it back and forth, I think we came up with something here that was really um, <laughs> just a lot of features. Just real quick too, uh, we're cooking up something similar, of course, now f with the a, a version of a plate reverb that came just after the steel plates, the large steel plates, which is a, a much smaller uh, form factor, gold foil plates, uh, which EMT put out in the early 70s. It's called the, ours is going to be called the GF240. And those are very unique as well. The uh, gold plates had a, they had a little bit of a wider frequency response. I, I guess right, it's, yeah. it's a thinner material than the steel plate. It would be, in effect, it would vibrate in a more closer to, I guess in quotation marks, random way. Anyway, man, yeah. that's fantastic. Thanks, Ernest, I'll see you soon. Bye. Take care.